Welcome. This is a webinar on the neuroscience of learning. And what we'll do today in this webinar is summarize the basic points, main ideas, some of the um, best strategies that you learned during the workshop when we were together. And then after that, we will explore a few things about where we are right now as uh, educators in working with the people that are our learners and uh, refine our thinking about all of that. Again, welcome to the webinar. When we are together, we created this culture, this environment, first of all, that felt very medical. Uh, we were actually introduced to the Medical Center of Neuroscience. And with that as our backdrop and our uh, frame for the day, we then launched into looking at how do we create a culture within which learning can thrive. And when I think about culture, I think from a biological standpoint, or from at least my biology class, that a culture was something that we put at the bottom of a Petri dish. And depending on that culture that we laid down, it determined the growth, the uh, vivaciousness of that growth, expansion of that growth, and it was based on the culture. That is also true when it comes to learning. We learn best in a culture that invites us to learn, that challenges us to learn. Anytime we can get into a learning situation where there is something to solve, something to discover, a problem that we need to unpack, a mystery that intrigues us enough to pull us in, it's that kind of culture within which the brain can expand, it can use its creative powers and problem solving powers. Now, in order to get that kind of culture, we explored also, what is the social emotional aspects of a culture within which our brain can survive, not just survive, but even thrive. And we spent some time together looking at how do we specifically build a social emotional culture where then the brain feels safe enough to take uh, cognitive risks. So I'm gonna flip to some PowerPoint slides for uh, just a moment. So here we go. All right, I think I'm sharing the whole screen and this will work just perfectly. And the phrase we used to summarize, encapsulate what we were talking about culture and the importance of culture was what you see here. When the culture is right, cognition thrives. And then if you'll remember, we work together in partners and then our partner repeated back to us and cognition thrives when the culture is right. So remember how that worked was we had two people together, one person started with when the culture is right, and your partner responded with cognition thrives and cognition thrives. And then you said, when the culture is right. So let's talk about what does it mean as culture is right? Not looking at right versus wrong, but right in this context, meaning useful. When the culture is useful for high levels of brain functioning, then cognition thrives. And if cognition is thriving, that means that that culture that we lay down in the Petri dish of our learning environment, that that culture is right, that it is most useful. One word we use to describe culture in that way is optimal. What is the optimal culture? What are the optimal conditions within which cognition can thrive? We worked together for probably half hour, 45 minutes actually, in establishing our learning culture together. Learning culture avoids assumptions. So as the facilitator of the culture, I'm not going to assume that everybody is ready to learn. I'm also not going to assume that it was everybody's 
good idea to be there. Although they were there by choice, a lot happens between the moment we sign up for a webinar and when that day actually arrives. And so there was choice that was, uh, the choices that were made by everyone who showed up to that workshop. And even though at some base level, people chose to be there in that workshop, as the facilitator, not going to assume that everybody's ready to learn, emotionally, psychologically ready to learn, that, uh, that they even socially have interacted enough where they feel safe with one another, supported by one another. We hadn't created yet a culture within which people have a, a sense of belonging. Like this is our learning community together. And that they feel valued, that when they do speak up, when they do share with the people around in their group or even out loud to the larger group, that they, yes, feel supported, yes, feel safe, but they feel like this, they're contributing to the larger, uh, culture of which we're creating. Consider the type of culture that you're building with your students. And yes, it might be halfway through the year. It might be just the beginning of the year, it might be the beginning of the semester. Wherever you are in your educational calendar, it is always the right time to establish culture, reestablish culture, maintain the culture that we have, uh, and do whatever we can to sustain a culture within which cognition can thrive. We know that the brain is a social organ, that we learn because of the interactions and the conversations we have with others. Hence, we spent time in partnerships and trios and small groups just sharing with one another. Uh, what's up? What's going on? How's the semester going? Uh, what are you excited about? What do you love about being an educator, about being a teacher? And we, we spent that time again because we know how important culture is, especially the social interactions, as well as the emotional safety, so that our brain can absolutely thrive. Because you and I, both have amazing brains. And we could say that we have amazing brains because we're educated, because we have degrees. Well, the truth is everybody has an amazing brain. And that would include every single one of the students who show up to your class every time. They have amazing brains. Now their perception of their amazing brain may not be fully developed, meaning that based on their prior experiences, they're not feeling really great about the brain that they have. And they're walking into a math class or an English class, and they weren't very successful up until now. And so they walk in with an emotional reserve. They walk in with social reserve. They are carrying all of that past, all of the hopefully little successes, but for many people, there's more overwhelming unsuccesses that has contributed to their mindset about their own ability, capacity, competence to do well in your subject area. So having said all that, think for a moment about the culture that you've created with your learners and ask yourself, is it an optimal culture? Is it a place where everybody in that class is comfortable, should they choose, comfortable to turn and talk to their partner about the question you asked or about what they're thinking about what they wanna write or maybe what they think the first step in solving the problem is? Do they feel safe enough to that, do that? Do they, is there a, a strong sense of support, both from you, right, as the instructor, the educator, the teacher, and do they feel supported that when they share, that whoever it is they're sharing with can accept and listen and communicate in such a way that their voice is valued and their thinking is valued. 
as you think about your culture, think also about what is the tone? What's the feeling that happens during your, your class, your lecture, your experience, your lab? Is it full of wonder? Is there a sense of anticipation, curiosity? And how's your own internal culture, meaning your attitude towards your subject and towards your students? We know that as much as we try to hide certain perceptions and thoughts about either a particular student or a particular class because of what time of the day it is, or maybe even about this particular section of the unit that we're teaching right now. We know that as much as we might want to control a less than positive attitude in those situations, we know as human beings that that whatever it is that we're thinking, whatever our attitude and belief and perception is, it will spill out, if you will. And people pick that up. It's the nonverbals, of course. So consider your own personal culture. What is your mindset about what you're teaching and about who you're teaching? What's your beliefs about the people that are in your learning uh, environment, your learners? What's your belief about them? Their be your belief about are they capable? Are they, can they build competence? Uh, do you believe in their own ability? Uh, not believing in their own ability, but do you believe that they have the ability to do really well in your course? In what ways are you communicating that? Yes, nonverbals and smiles and head, head nods and thumbs up and connecting with, with students but also verbally, what comments are you making to the class? What are you saying about their, the possibility of them doing well? And when you're teaching that one unit or that one section in that one unit that for some reason it just doesn't resonate uh, as uh, as deeply and as convincingly as other parts of the curriculum. And when you get to that part, consider your attitude about your own ability to present that material or to orchestrate learning experiences around that material. Does it have the same, uh, do you have the same passion and drive? And are you curious about what it is you're teaching? Do you find what it is you're teaching to be as intriguing as perhaps the first time you learned it? Now, because we've been working with the content for a long time, maybe it's just become a little normalized. We know the power of the person who is delivering or is orchestrating the learning. We know the power of that person's state of mind, if you will, their emotional, psychological condition, their beliefs, their perceptions, their mindsets about their curriculum. And I certainly hope that you approach the content that you teach with a sense of curiosity and wonder and discovery and exploration because it's contagious. When we get the culture right, cognition thrives. And cognition thrives when the culture's right. We spent a good time, uh, a good deal of our time together, really working this concept. And again, if you need to reestablish the culture, because the culture isn't just the feeling tone part, culture is also your policies, your procedures, your class agreements or your course agreements and or maybe even rules and all of those expectations that we lay out to our learners it's important that we revisit those and make sure that they're at the forefront and people are fully aware expectations due dates grading policies 
all of that because when people are clear, when people feel that they know how they're supposed to interact with the content and interact with one another and with you, then again, their brain can calm and it can now focus on higher levels of cognition. So maybe it's time to do a culture readjust, a culture reset with your learners. That's powerful to do in the middle of the course. And it's just as powerful to do with even more so at the beginning of the course. We then spent a majority of our time together exploring the brain mind learning principles. Now these are originally established and named, if you will, by Jeffrey and Renata Kane. And they actually produced a book, wrote a book called the 12 brain mind learning principles. And I have found these, although the book is a couple of decades old, I have found these principles to be, to resonate and to confirm the things that I was doing as an educator at that time. And since then, as I've delved deeper into the neuroscience, neurobiology, neurogenetics of learning, motivation, and behavior change, these, they still, they stand the, the test of time if you will, the research continues to support these 12 principles are, are true, are necessary for the brain to think at really high levels and to do that complex problem solving, those, that creativity and those uh, being able to see a challenge and then stick with it long enough and be able to pull it apart and put it back together and find the hints and the clues that they need in order to solve that so that's where we're going to head right now is a review. We did not get to all 12. In fact, you may remember that we introduced nine of those 12. And even during that time, when, uh, when we were exploring those nine, we, were, we set out to unpack all nine of them. We got to eight for sure. And in today's webinar, I wanna focus on what seemed to be the four, we might get to five, the four of these principles that not only are simple to understand, they are all actually easy to implement. So easy to implement like, oh, that strategy makes sense. I can do that and easy to understand and by looking at the strategies we're currently doing and seeing how they line up with these brain mind learning principles. So that's what we're gonna go right now. Review those, hit some strategies, and as we do so, allow yourself to think about the last lesson you taught or the best lesson that you've taught so far or even a lesson that's coming up in, in the next couple of weeks. Allow yourself to th use that, uh, that experience that you had or will have and to then look at it through the filter of these learning principles. And as you do, consider to what degree am I amplifying this principle so I can optimize the brain's capacity uh, and ability to think at really high levels. Principle number one, our brains are complex, adaptable social systems. Complex meaning, as you know, for example, as you know, we've been studying the brain for decades. And it seems that with every new layer that we uh, explore about what's happening within the brain, all the way down to the chemical level and the electrical level and the genetic level and the encoding level. We get deep down inside those things. It just seems to be beautiful in its complexity. Like it's simple to understand, but amazingly complex. And that leads me to be thinking that I wonder if we underestimate our learners' ability to learn at higher levels. 
if indeed our brain is this complex, adaptable, a malleable entity that we call our mind, if indeed it is deeply complex and has perhaps even uh, hidden or yet to be uh, surfaced abilities, I wonder if in some of the ways in which we interact with our learners communicates something less than the, uh, the, the wonder and possibility of our brain's complex nature. And I wonder if in some of the assignments that we ask our students to do, the types of questions that we ask of them to answer, are we pushing them? Are we throwing uh, possibilities out there, knowing that maybe they'll struggle, maybe it'll be too challenging, and that's okay, because together we can find a way to go after this. And principle number one also reminds us about it being a social system. One of the six um, brains natural learning systems is called the social system. It's actually hardwired into our neural structures that we have got to have time to talk about, talk about it on paper, talk about it through a poster, talk to it face to face, one on one, small group. Because here's what we know, we know that when we can talk about the content, then we can create a mental structure for it. But it's only in our ability to articulate what it is that we're learning do we then form the type of structures that we need to remember what it is we're learning? Here's a few strategies for principle number one. Simulations. Perhaps one of the most, uh, uh, I don't know what really I uh, like, uh, inviting activities that we can do is set up simulations that mirror real life. Some subjects are, uh, clearly easier to do that if we're teaching high levels of physics or calculus or something like that. A little hard to make it real life, like something that I have to do every single day. And yet still we can place those, those problems and challenges in the context of something that we can get our mind around. Uh, and so we can invest ourselves into the simulation, a role play. Uh, whether that's through video and we're noticing a situation, uh, uh, an experience, or it's something that we're invited to do while we're together in class. Field trips, again, makes, uh, makes what it is that we're learning within its own context. I used to, I used to think, and I don't think I was as conscious about it when I was younger as I am now, but especially as I think back, I remember going to the zoo. I think it was fourth grade. And I remember going, going to the zoo and it was an hour, hour and 15 minute bus ride to the local zoo. And we were, I, I remember, well, I've, been, I've, I've not been to this zoo before. And we had spent a good two weeks, maybe three weeks, understanding the animals that we would see at the zoo. And we understood um, their lifespan, we understood what they ate, we understood uh, whether they were prey or not, we understood some of their basic instincts, uh, you know, distinguishing factors between uh, males and females. There was, oh, man, I remember we just spent a whole lot of time. In fact, I had to choose, in the small group of us, I think it was, I had to choose an animal that we wanted to study. You know, where is that animal found in eating patterns and mating patterns and uh, uh, I was going to say hibernation patterns, but uh, I'm talking about when they, oh, migration patterns, right? So, so I remember we spent a bunch of time doing that. And then we got to go to the zoo. And I remember when I got to the zoo, it was just less, less thrilling than I had anticipated it being. You know, maybe it was, it was because the animals were not in their natural habitats, although they were in a smaller version of their habitat, but they weren't allowed to just roam freely and do what they do naturally. Maybe that was it. 
Maybe that I anticipated a greater sense of interaction with those animals. But what I do remember is that it was disappointing. Still had a great time. Still experienced things that I'd never seen before. And then as I've gotten older and thought about that, what if, because our brains are highly complex and socially um, wired to learn, what if we would have done the field trip first? Yeah, loaded up on the bus with our sandwiches and our juice boxes and whatever else we had and, you know, our little field journal notes that we were supposed to take notes in. And what if we descended on that zoo as if we were explorers, as if we were seeing things for the very first time? And our task was to draw to the very best of our ability X number of those animals. And that we were to ask, maybe they were already set up questions that we were to ask the person who was going around uh, leading us on this tour of animals. What if, would that have changed my experience, our experience? So let's take it into your classroom for a moment, your content. What can be done? What simulations, field trip, not even field trip, like, like go someplace, maybe a virtual field trip, but what simulations could happen before the learning, not the learning, but the content is added to it? Is there something now, as you think about it, that you kind of teach all the content first, and then there's the experiment, or then there's the, the project, or then there's the simulation. This can't happen in, in, with every piece of content that we deliver, that our learners learn. But, but as a general rule of thumb, we're creating a sense of exploration and discovery and curiosity and interest that then would lead the learner to want to know more about what it is that we're learning. Hmm. Something to consider. Group problem solving, anything that's a small group setting where we're gonna uh, do that. And, and a point about group projects. I certainly hope that when you do put uh, learners into groups, that they are graded as a group collectively and they're graded as individuals. You, we've all heard and been part of groups where you know, either we were the one who did all the work or we weren't really sure. And so we allowed somebody else to do all the work in the group. Keep that in mind. And then coming back to this culture, like in the bottom of the Petri dish, the culture, establishing a community where people feel that they can belong and share their ideas with one another. Principle number two, the search for meaning is innate and occurs through patterning. Some of the neuroscience friends that I have like to think of it as, think of meaning as the holy grail of learning. It is, it is the precious item that we in our learning uh, process are seeking to find. It is, it is literally the core ingredient to learning. I can make sense of my learning when I can make meaning out of it. it I have, an, yes, an understanding of it, but even sense of a, a personal meaning about how it adds value to myself or contributes to humanity. And finding meaning happens through, a, through uh, finding patterns that when I take this information, I take this information, something clicks, something goes off in my brain and says, oh, okay, now that makes sense. Sometimes we, we, uh, when we're looking across uh, our learners, we, I know that we, te we love these moments and we teach to these moments, these aha moments, right? Where students go, oh, that is how that all comes together. And it's those, moments, those aha moments where meaning is discovered. Let's explore this a little deeper. F 
fundamental to the, the acquisition of new knowledge is the brain's ability to find something from the past, past meaning yesterday, last class I was in, um, something five years ago. So we call that prior knowledge and experience. What prior knowledge, what existing knowledge do I already have that I can pull forward and take the new information and attach it to it? Call that building schema. And what experience can I draw from? And can, what can I draw from my experiences in relationships with friends? Can I draw on my experiences of, of having worked in a certain kind of job uh, environment? Can I draw from my experience of playing sports, uh, my experience of a certain kind of music? I think of the variety of, of, uh, of domains of our life. And as the designer of learning, and then as the facilitator of learning, our job is to help students to make a connection. One way to do that, I know, it's, we have 25, 30, 50, 75 students uh, in, our, in our class or in our course. And I, it's, it's like, well, how do I make meaning for her? And how do I make meaning for him? Like, I, you know, I kind of know them, but I don't know everything about their life. Aha, here's the best part we don't have to make the meaning. They make that meaning. They put together the con and make the connections. That's the beauty of facilitating learning. So one question that we can ask students is, with this new content, where can, else can you find this in your life? What is this similar to in your life? What other connection can you make? You know, think about your, what you know about math or what you know about addition. Think about what you know about chemistry or how things work together. Um, think about just, uh, have you ever constructed something, built something, had to put something together? Think about that for a moment and notice how what we're learning right now is similar to that. And then have the students talk about that. Oh, I remember this time when I was in the, this situation at work and the boss said this and I did this. And, you know, that, that's very similar to this economic principle that we're working right on right now. Whatever connection that they can make for them to make meaning, it's the holy grail of learning. There are multiple strategies that we can use. Perhaps you are familiar with visual auditory kinesthetic. Perhaps you're familiar with multiple intelligences like spatial, visual, and linguistic, and interpersonal, inter, and inter, uh, intrapersonal, logical, mathematical, bodily kinesthetic, musical. You approach setting up our learning, our content. Think about it in how many ways can students gain access to that content? Through picture, through sound, through emotion, or, or an intense feeling and emotion? And anytime we can have the learner reteach what it is they just learned. That can happen after the first two steps of a math problem. That can happen after dissecting a part of a novel, for example, and understanding the character and some characteristics. And maybe there's a revelation that happens about the character and a prediction of what's going to happen in the rest of the story. And um, then asking students to just repeat what it is that we've been talking about. Like, what are two main things that we've talked about so far? They then are reteaching the information. In doing so, they have to see the patterns coming together. And by doing so, they create a more uh, uh, solid mental structure. Number three, emotions are essential to pattern making and meaning. So we know the importance of meaning, and we know that, that through patterns we construct meaning, the holy grail of learning. And what principle number three reminds us is that in that meaning, there is emotion. Dr. Ledoux, a neuroscientist, uh, said a number of years ago 
that all thinking is emotional. So every thought that runs through our mind, when you think about thinking, think about neural pathways, because that's the, the bridges, if you will, of which the electrical impulses, the action potential happens. And that is the kind of biology of thinking, if you will, how those things come together. That in the very neurological structure, that when there's firing happening, the neurotransmitters that are being fired, the, the chemicals in that bath of wiring that, that we call our brain, that the thinking is wrapped in emotion. So that means that the emotion can be joyful. It can be the emotion could have a sense of intrigue and wonder and discovery. The emotion might also be, uh, a, feels challenging for a moment. Uh, it feels, um, it can even feel uh, difficult or frustrating. Anytime we can heighten the emotional environment of learning, the stronger the neural pathways will be. Here's some ideas. There's a lot of talk these days about social emotional learning and the importance of uh, mitigating stress. And just think about our all, you know, our own life and us being teachers, just all the things that are going on in our life at one time. And yet in this one slice of time, we're to be completely present, calm, and centered so that we exude this place of safety and support for our students, but also then our, our, our stress emotions are not being communicated with the content. So what can we do to release stress? It seems really simple, but it is so true. Asking learners to simply take a big deep breath. You know, we don't have to get weird about it, you know, close eyes, clamp our fingers together, you know, put on, you know, all music. And not that that's weird in the sense of um, bizarre, but for many people that, um, that, that doesn't quite evoke the type of uh, experience we want them to have as they're releasing their stress. So big, deep belly breaths and just letting it out, especially right before some, some uh, a really challenging part of the math equation or we're dissecting some uh, attribute of some chemical, chemical compound. It's just getting ourselves. Sometimes just the content itself brings stress. For many students, when they walk into a math class, they're just all ramped up already just because of their prior knowledge and experience. So what can we do? Is it a story we tell, you know, at the beginning of class just to calm everybody down? Is it the way in which we greet and interact with people? Is it maybe something that they talk about with one another? Uh, I, have to, I have at times and have seen other teachers do where the first couple, three minutes of class is just simply, hey, uh, what did you have to do before you got here to class? especially with adult learners. But um, you know, how's your day going so far? And without spending 20 minutes and getting into a psychotherapy session, I think we can just allow people to express what's going on so they can get it outside of their head. And then they can take some breaths and relax into the moment, which we call your class. Humor, maybe there's always a joke that goes up on the PowerPoint or on the screen. Maybe it's a simple little game. They come in, there's some cards, and they have to make a winning hand or something. Something to get them to switch off the stress hormones and switch on something that feels calm and relaxed. Increasing rapport. We've already seen that in principle number one about our brains being social uh, organs that, are, that require social interaction. What can we do to increase the rapport? Yes, ourselves with students. And that reminds me, there are some students that are really easy to build rapport with. There are other students, we find that a little bit more challenging. Those are the students in particular that we wanna reach out to just to bridge that gap for ourselves, but also for them. Partner learning increases rapport. Anytime we can set people up in dialogues, uh, I, I love the strategy of, uh, 
of having in pairs, having one student take one item and the other student take another item and then debate on uh, which one is better. Uh, just a simple example would be uh, one person is the number two, another person is a number six. And they are to argue why two is more important than six or why six is more important than two. I know, sounds silly. But what it does is it creates rapport, a whole lot of laughter and fun, but also gets people to rethink the concept in a different way. Foster positive emotions, high fives, uh, little chants and cheers when we get through a difficult section, a challenging section of our curriculum. Uh, when the scores were better than we anticipated, uh, when the answers that they're providing us in our dialogues and questions in class, it's a uh, it's like, whoa, that was insightful. Uh, and being surprised about that. Anything we can do with celebrations and acknowledgements to students, yes, as a general class, but even individual acknowledgements. All right, we've talked about uh, a lot so far. Principle number one, complex adaptable social system. Uh, principle number two about uh, Meaning making is innate. I, we search for that and it happens through finding patterns and making connections. And then here reminding ourselves how important emotions are to, uh, to optimizing the condition for learning. Of these three so far, which one are you doing a really good job with? Because you think about your teaching, think about your, your culture. What are you doing well? What have you done to establish a culture in which cognition can thrive? How are you doing with celebrations and acknowledgements? Yeah, we'll continue. When I go to number four, our brains can simultaneously perceive and create parts and holes. Uh, I just put that together for just a moment, right? Here's this bicycle that we can see on the screen, right? And we know that the bicycle looks like when it's all put together. And we can see how that bicycle as a system is also comprised of individual parts. And we know that the whole only makes sense, only functions properly, only uh, uh, does what it's supposed to do because of the individual parts. Now I find this brain principle to be uh, astonishing actually, because how does my brain simultaneously perceive the whole and create the parts? How can it see the parts and the whole all at the same time? Because when I try to explain something, it feels very logical and sequential, very orderly. But this principle reminds us our brains are so amazing that we can actually hold the whole idea as we're dissecting it. And we can look at the individual parts and keep in mind how it all fits in the whole. That I find to be astonishing. Here's a few strategies that can help us. Global overviews. Consider the beginning of a unit. And rather than just jumping into after the unit we're studying now is this, and the major outcome or objective of this unit is, and then just diving into lesson number one. What if lesson number one, or maybe there was a lesson zero, where we were to lay out the entire unit? I've seen this done in a high school classroom where a, a teacher was teaching about World War II, and it was the first day of the unit. And he spent a majority of that 55 minute period talking about the entire World War II from the beginning to the end, naming the important people, the events, where they happened, the timeline, reasons behind things, treaties, alliances, all of that stuff. And he did it in story form while he was creating a mind map on the very large whiteboard behind him. I, at that moment, as I'm observing him, finally like understood like, oh, that's World War II. Oh, that's how that all fits together. Oh, that was what people were after and what they got at the very end and who had to compromise. It just brought it all together. 
Now, some people might think that would be a very useful thing to do at the very end of the unit, like culminating, like bringing it all together. What this principle reminds us of is if we've spent, well, I don't know, let's say four weeks, if we spent four weeks, that's a long time, but if we spent four weeks on just looking at the individual parts, the names, the dates, the people, the places, and we were just doing that all along the way, and then at the end showed the global uh, overview of the whole thing so that all those pieces could now connect into this larger frame. Huh, I wonder how much people were remembered all along the way. Because it needs to attach to prior knowledge and experience. And you can think of prior knowledge and experience as at the very first day of this unit, we actually created an experience and a body of knowledge, a, a big picture overview to which now the individual pieces that we're learning can connect to. Sequencing the steps for mastery of the material. So think of it this way, global overview, big picture, and now we're gonna sequence the steps along the way. Now, of course, that makes, a, makes sense because it's in the sequencing of the steps where we can find the patterns, make greater meaning, and then master the material. This one strongly encourage you to be consciously and intentionally purposeful about this next strategy, which is alternating between the big picture overview and the details. So what does that look like? It could be that at the start of every lesson, it's, hey, remember, this was our global overview. Remember how to had this kind of stage and this stage and the next stage of, of this process? Okay, we are still in stage one where we're learning how these individual parts can help to create that. Then go through the lesson as you, you possibly normally would. Maybe it doesn't happen at the beginning of every class, that global overview but maybe it happens at the end of the class. Maybe it happens at the beginning of the week and you do it again at the end of the week. So yes, it's important for us to do that for our students so they can keep getting the bigger picture because maybe the vocabulary or the, the conceptual ideas of our content, they're still trying to get their head around that. And as we move forward through that unit, ask them to make the connections take a look at their notes, put them in small groups, take a look at the notes that we had over this last week. Where in this global overview do, does, these, does this individual information, where does it show up? How can it support? We're gonna move past number five and we're gonna to get to number six, partially because of time, but also remember I'm highlighting the ones that I think are the, more, the simplest to understand and perhaps the easiest to identify that we're using already and that we could choose to do in the future. Number six, facts and skills are remembered best in contextual memory. Episodic memory is another way of, uh, another term for this, which is different than taxon memory. Taxon memory has to do with lists and, and items of things and names and procedures and uh, formulas, uh, sequences, if you will, flow charts, if you will, and memorizing those, uh, like memorizing the multiplication tables, uh, memorizing the capitals of the states, remember, uh, memorizing the elements of the periodic table, uh, names and places and dates of, of people from a historical standpoint, that's that type of memory. Can we do it? Yes, we can do it. Brain mind principle number six reminds us that those facts and the skills that we're, we're learning to do are remembered best in contextual memory, in episodic memory. So as a diagram here shows that if we can connect it to a job that somebody has, the relationships they have in their life, their hobbies, their sports, and we can do that in story form, that is going to take the fact and the skill and make it, put it in a, in, in, uh, in a richer contextual environment where the brain can put more brain power in it, 
build more neural connections, find the neural pathways that are existing already uh, to, to help uh, amplify the understanding of the information at that time. So here are some things we can do about that. We can create intense sensory experiences. Maybe they walk into the lab in a science class and you're standing at the front with a blowtorch and some tube or something of something. And, uh, and as they're entering in, things are igniting. Uh, maybe it's uh, they walk into a history class and or a geography class and you're dressed maybe not in full costume, but some uh, prop that you have that would help to cause the learner's brains to access a story that they might already know, creating these intense sensory experiences. Maybe they walk in and you and another uh, professor or instructor are having an argument about something, uh, which is actually the argument that they're going to study later on in that class period. And in the workshop, you'll remember that early on, after we established that, that culture, the very first things we did is we went on this learning journey. And we imagined that the floor of the workshop was a clock face. And that there were numbers around those clock faces. And then we went around to each of the numbers. And at each number, there was a scene. There was an, there was an experience. There was a little mini movie that happened. It had, uh, it elicited certain sights. We heard sounds. We attached something we already knew to this little scene that was being played out in front of us. We could see the colors. There was always some sense of emotion, whether it was joy or uh, concern, uh, elation, celebration. Uh, wonder even. And we did that with the, the numbers around the clock face, numbers one through nine. And then we spent some time not even knowing what it is, the content that we were learning, but just simply learning, being amazed that our brain could remember these nine scenes and the detail that it was able to. But then we went around and created a picture, an icon, if you will, for each one of those so that we were building in a reinforcement of that content by coming up with symbols that would help us to remember it. That was one way to create uh, somewhat of an intense sensory, sensory experience of which we could all invest in. Now, at that time, you didn't know that it had anything to do with the brain-mind learning principles. And by the way, thanks for playing along, even though you didn't know that there was hidden content in it. But what I love about those kinds of experiences is that when we embed content into episodes, into stories, not only is it a richer experience, but now when we go, when we start now teaching the content, the specific content, and make the connection to that episode, that story, there's much richer understanding of what that particular concept might be. Role play, acting things out. We bring more elements of who we are as a person and as a human when we role play, when we act a certain character in a certain way. Uh, maybe as we're studying characterization, we, one person takes on the, the one main character in that chapter and two or three other people take on the other characters. And yes, sometimes we read it like it's a play and we can do dialogue that way. Uh, but really when we, when we do role plays and act things out, we want the learner to experience the best they possibly can, like really invest themselves in the attitude, the mindset, and the emotion, possibly even the actions of that person. Use body motions. It seems natural to do in elementary, possibly even middle school. When we get in high school or the college level, this is one of those strategies that kind of goes off to the side. And I believe it does that because as adults, we don't, yeah, we really don't learn by by doing games or role plays. We say that that was, that's more elementary. When I was younger, I needed to learn like that. 
to use our hands to make body motions or hand signals around important concepts. Uh, we just don't leave that to the children. Well, brain mind learning principle doesn't have an age to it. These are, these are not things to remember just because we teach elementary or middle school. But the way our brains are wired up, we know that muscle memory is one of the strongest memory systems that we have. So what would freedom look like as a facial expression, as a body position, as a hand gesture? What would allied forces look like? What would congruent triangles look like? Maybe there's even a sound that goes with it. You can be creative about this. And then tell stories and use metaphor. Metaphors are word pictures. And we know that a picture is worth a thousand words. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, yeah, pictures are worth a thousand words. And the, and the point of that is, is when we see a picture, we have to tell the story behind it. That's why we wrote that we drew out the icons for and the little drawings for each of those items, those scenes, those stories around our clock face. Because when we look at the item, our brain now engages in a whole new level. I have to now explain what this is. And then in that explaining is the story, if you will. I want to keep moving. Past seven, on to number eight. Number eight. Learning is enhanced by challenge and inhibited by threat. Enhanced by challenge and inhibited by threat. And you remember in the workshop that we actually did and looked at this particular video. I'm not sure how well the audio is coming through. He's breathing very heavy. Uh, but even if you can't hear the sound, notice what you notice. What feelings are arriving are arising in here as we watch this person do an amazingly challenging event. Perhaps that's the best part, right? When he finally makes it over to the rock ledge and he lets out this scream. Again, goes back to principle number three, right? Emotions are necessary for meaning making, right? So here's a challenging situation. I'm sure this person is way beyond their comfort zone uh, and puts themselves out there, certainly hoping that they can solve this challenge in front of, in front of himself, but not knowing absolutely for sure. So on the edge, exploring, discovering, problem solving, figuring things out, amazingly complex and sensory intense experience. And then he gets at the end and now this explosion of emotion, of joy, of celebration for accomplishment. We also know that learning is inhibited by threat. Threat, perceived even, like a, the threat of, I'm not going to do this well. The threat of, I'm not sure what, what my peers are going to think of me. The threat of what the, the teacher might be thinking of me. If I give a wrong answer, if I turn in a paper that's not quite perfect, uh, it's inhibited, right? Our whole brains just downshift when we have um, fear or anxiety, stress or threat. We can, we can counter that by immersing people in meaningful, challenging situations. Hold debates, as I had mentioned earlier with that example. Inject surprise, suspense, a, a disorder to things. What if you showed a paragraph of, of writing and you're helping your students to become uh, better writers of, of paragraphs and essays? And that the paragraph that you show is just completely jumbled up. Like it kind of makes some sense because it all kind of has to do with the same thing, but it's just a little, it's truncated somehow. It just doesn't flow logically. And that's disorder to the brain. It's trying to find the pattern, but the pattern isn't making any sense. Uh, a sense of suspense. Uh, maybe there's a part of, um, 
the content that you're about ready to teach that is that is like the most important. Maybe it's the third step in the math problem. It's the most important. And what if there was a, a, a sense from you of this surprise and suspense? When we first start solving the problem, it's like, ah, oh, there are four steps to this. And you know what? Number three, number three, that's going to unlock the entire process. But we can't get to number three yet because you don't know numbers, steps one and two. Now, that's just a couple of statements, but in my tone and in my facial expressions and my hand motions, it creates this sense of surprise and suspense of, hmm, I wonder, anticipation. I wonder what's going to happen next. Why is that one the most important? You mentioned this earlier on about asking learners to link ideas to other subjects. How is this similar to art? How is this similar to equations in mathematics? How is this similar to uh, treaties or uh, covenants that were made or uh, like the Bill of Rights? How is this finding something where they can make an attachment to something that they already know? By, by linking ideas together, first of all, the content doesn't seem so threatening. When I'm linking it to things that I already know, feel confident and competent about. Uh, but it builds those patterns, right? It makes those patterns, which deepens the meaning. As we find the patterns, as it becomes more meaningful, then it releases more joy. It's more satisfaction and fulfillment about the learning that's actually occurring. I want to take just a moment, get back to this brain idea, especially around threat. There is this little part, as we talked about in the workshop, of our brain, two parts actually, the amygdala, and they're about the size of the end of your thumb, shaped like almonds. They have a, a myriad of functions, but the function we're going to deal with right now is that the amygdala is the emotional control center of our brain. And under these conditions of fear, anxiety, stress, and threat, Epinephrine, cortisol, is massively released. And when these neurochemicals are released, it causes our brain to downshift, if you will, to pull its energy and resources to the more the center part of the brain, the limbic part of the brain, and so that we can be, protect ourselves, that we can go more into fight and flight, Wonderful to have fight or flight. Not so wonderful to have fight or flight when I'm learning some new concepts um, or when I'm interacting with my peers or even with the teacher. And it literally shadows this POW part of the brain, right? The part of the brain that ignites with curiosity and wonder and exploration and can pull things together and problem solve and predict, uh, evaluate and analyze. Uh, that's what we want our students' brains. That's the optimal condition for the brain, for optimal places for learning, right? But when the amygdala is all stimulated and excited and agitated, it literally clouds that part of the brain. Now we can take a look at uh, what do we do to combat it, if you will. How can we still keep this sense of challenge and with high positive emotion, uh, but then really take a look at how, uh, how our brains operate? Oh, I can see on the screen now where it says brain principle. Number three is attending. Hmm, it's not attending, it's emotion. I'll have to fix that for a future webinar. Consider laughter, exploration, anticipation, relevance, which is meaning and novelty. We've hit on these five little ingredients or conditions for the hippocampus, which by the way is the center of new memory formation. So when these characteristics are heightened, the amygdala calms down. And as the amygdala, amygdala calms down, now the brain opens its up, itself up to that more challenging levels of thinking and problem solving. We're going to wrap up our time together. Uh, 
with a strategy that I believe we, we shared at the very end of our workshop. The strategy is called illicit thinking. Now, why am I bringing this back up? This is one of those simple strategies that gets students' brains thinking longer um, and, and to problem solve just a little bit longer and uh, keeps us as a, at a pace where we're honoring thinking. Right. There are four parts of this thinking strategy. Actually, it's illicit thinking. It's a questioning strategy, if you will. The P is to prompt. So here, here's the situation. We've taught some content. We've done a great job with it. It's, it, it was rich in sensory experience. Um, you know, they were making connections to different parts of their life. We just did this fabulous job. This even works if we didn't do such a fabulous job. This little strategy works just as well. But what first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna prompt before we ask the question. So the A is ask, ask the question. P is prompt. Now, since brains operate at different levels of, of, of um, flow, if you will, that um, every 90 seconds or so, our brain is going through a little shift in its attention, its focus, and the neurochemistry of the brain, whether it's moving energy up and down, or it's moving it front to back or side to side, whatever that uh, conditions might be, what we do know is that not two, not, there's no two brains in our classroom that are operating exactly in the same flow at the same time. So what prompting does is it's a quick little review, and it says to our students, hey, look, we just covered these three or four things. And a quick little review, maybe the review happens because they look at their notes. Maybe it's a quick little pair share review, or maybe it's just a review that we do from the front of the room. We do this prompt so we can get their brain, all the brains in the room, to at least be on the same page. Now we can ask the question, because we've created the conditions within which we can pull the, we can drop the question is. So if we use that page metaphor, if prompting is helping all the brains to uh, be on the same page, what the question does is helps focus their brain to a particular area on that page. So it isn't everything that we've ever learned about this subject, but we've now prompted, created the, the page. And now with the question, we can ask for a specific part of that information on the page. A rule of thumb about asking the question. We definitely do not want to attach a name to the question. What that usually sounds like is, <clears throat> Mark, what are the four parts to this equation? Or, what are the four parts of this equation, Mark? Now, if you've ever been in this situation before where you've been sitting in class, learning some new information, and the professor, the instructor, the teacher, whoever that is at the front of the room, all of a sudden calls you by name and follows it with a question, oh, I bet you can feel even now what that was like. And it didn't matter if they first asked the question and then put your name to it. All of a sudden, well, if we think about the amygdala for a moment, sense of fear, little sense of threat, hmm, some anxiousness, perhaps. So what we want to do instead is simply ask the question. By simply asking the question, all the brains are now engaged. Because as soon as you call on Mark, Mark's the only brain that's engaged, if it's even thinking at a higher level at that moment. And all the rest of the brains in the class are really thankful that their name isn't Mark. And so they're taking a bit of a hiatus. They're relaxing to the place of, hmm, let's see how Mark handles this. And they know that if Mark's is the right answer, most likely the teacher's just gonna keep moving on through the content. Hmm. No names attached to the question. That way we keep every brain thinking all the time. You're most familiar, I'm guessing, with the W, which is wait. You've heard about wait time to increase thinking time. Well, that's exactly what this is. If the question is worth asking, it's worth thinking about. 
And we know that constructing our thoughts, especially with new content, takes a few moments. We gotta think for a moment. We gotta pull things together. I gotta look at my notes, perhaps. I gotta formulate it in some uh, sentence where I can communicate it where it makes sense and it's logical, it's rational. And that takes a few moments to do that. And that's why we breathe. How long? No, that's why we wait. <clears throat> How long do we wait? Three, five seconds, eight seconds, 10 seconds. The complexity of the question and its answer would determine how long we might want to wait. But as a rule of thumb, three to five seconds, which is just long enough to take a big, deep cleansing breath. <sighs> that signals to everybody in the class, huh, this is worth thinking about. Teachers not run, uh, uh, racing through this. This, uh huh. I thought I thought that I knew, and maybe because they're not calling on people yet, oh, maybe there's a little deeper thinking I need to do. And the E is elicit. Elicit now responses from people. Now this is a tricky part, and it's a it's a rule of thumb again. But if what one of the goals we have in our class is to maintain high levels of thinking for prolonged periods of time, then eliciting multiple responses gets brains, keeps brains thinking. So for example, elicit. So you had time to wait and think. Mark's had time to, to think this through. And now Mark is called on. Mark? Now, because I've had time to think, chances are I'm going to pull together something that makes a whole lot more sense to myself and everybody else. And so I'm going to give an answer. And let's just say on this particular day, I'm particularly smart, and I give the right answer. Oftentimes, as teachers, we just go, oh, thank you. So glad somebody got the right answer. And we say, thank you very much. That's exactly the, the answer to that question. And we move on. Or we call on somebody else. But then why would we call on somebody else when the right answer's already been given? And especially if we acknowledge that it was the right answer. So let's do this instead. We elicit a response from Mark. Mark gives an answer. Let's say it's the right answer. And we simply say, thank you. And then we choose another student. And now that student's thinking, wait, I thought Mark, Mark's answer was right. Is it right? Is it, is it not right? Teacher didn't say anything. Hmm. So now they say they, their answer. Maybe it's identical to my answer. Maybe not. Maybe it's different. Thank you is our response. We choose someone else. We choose someone else. And most likely, well, sometimes all four people will, might get the right answer, which then we can just affirm that it is, acknowledge them, thank them again for their response. Or maybe, which oftentimes happens, is that maybe two of the people had the right response and the other two were close, but not quite. Now, with those responses, those answers out into the thinking space, we can then ask the class as a whole, huh, which one of those four answers is correct? They can go to a quick pair share, figure it out. You can call on a few more people if you'd like, or you can ask for a call or response to what that right answer is, or you can say the right answer. But this four step way of engaging students in thinking through a question raises the cognitive level in the class, in the culture of the class, in the cognitive culture of the class, if you will. It raises the expectation that I'm not only going to review, I'm going to give you the question and I'm going to give you some time to think about it. That sends a message of respect, that you value thinking, that we actually believe that thinking is, is, is worth time and the investment of time so we can formulate our thoughts and then articulate it as accurate, accurately as we know how. And by eliciting multiple responses to the same question and simply responding with thank you in the first round keeps every brain thinking at just a little bit of a higher level. Well, we've covered quite a bit. Uh, 
uh, in our webinar today, and I know that I have uh, spent all of the time talking, actually, but I hope and I believe that what has happened in this last hour and, and a little more is that you've been reminded of what is central to creating a culture within which cognition thrives, of which our brain can be released to do its optimal functioning, which is to explore, to solve challenges, to be creative, to interact socially, to, to be willing to take risks as part of the discovery process. Thanks for joining me on this uh, this webinar today on the neuroscience of learning. And whatever you do, remember that every single day, who you are in your passion for your content always communicates louder than the content itself. Thanks for doing the work that you do with helping our learners, regardless of their age, to realize that they are capable because they're building their competence in whatever subject that you're laying out before them. Thanks for joining us.